Welcome to the alchemy of Finnegan's Waste. Mind your hats going in. The clip you just saw from Alejandro Jodorowsky's film, The Holy Mountain, depicts the excremental vision of an alchemist who tells a thief, the Jesus looking guy in the egg, you are excrement. You can turn yourself into gold. This scene depicts many alchemical processes that James Joyce alluded to and parodied in Finnegan's Wake. Most importantly, the transformation of base matter, human excrement, into the sublime, here gold, by the action of a mysterious substance known as the Philosopher's Stone. We also see in this clip alchemical equipment that appear in the wake, such as the Athenor or alchemical furnace and the egg-shaped hermetic vase. Alchemical processes such as sublimation, distillation, and fermentation, and alchemical symbols written on the body of the alchemist's assistant. In this presentation, we'll explore Joyce's excremental vision in the passage of the wake where the most significant alchemical references are found, the haunted ink bottle episode on pages 182 to 186, in which Shem the alchemist distills ink from his own excrement and covers his body with that ink. We'll also touch on two of the historical alchemists who appear in the wake, Giordano Bruno of Nola and Zosimus of Panopolis. Zosimus, a third century Alexandrian alchemist cited in the Haunted Ink Bottle episode and elsewhere in the wake, merged early scientific practices with spiritual visions. Through observation and proto-scientific inquiry, Zosimus established theoretical principles of chemistry. For example, he observed that when chemicals react with one another, their properties are not just combined or average as we would expect in, in a mere mixture, but they're completely uh, transformed. Zosimus was not only a keen scientific observer, he was also a mystic in the Gnostic and Hermetic traditions. One of Zosimus's texts presents a series of dreams or visions related to alchemy. Zosimus describes a mystical process of human distillation in which a man of copper is boiled alive until he becomes a sacred offering of spirit through transformation of the body. The visions reveal that through alchemical processes of conjunction and separation, the man of copper gives and the water stone receives. The sky gives and the earth receives. Thunder yields flashing fire. All things are interwoven and unravel. Carl Jung interpreted Zosimus's visions as an alchemical allegory for the transformation of the human psyche. The goal of the alchemist was to purify various substances, including excrement, to form the legendary substance known as the Philosopher's Stone. In her 1980 book, Alchemy in Finnegan's Wake, Barbara D. Bernard describes this process as the goal of the hermetic art. She writes, metaphorically, this purification was represented as killing the body of the metal to release its soul and accomplish its rebirth as gold. Alchemy embodied the rec reconciliation of opposites. In it, such dichotomies as death, rebirth, body, soul, base metal, gold were resolved. We now turn to the uses of excrement in Finnegan's Wake. The phrase uh, excremental vision was coined by literary critic Middleton Murray in 1954 to express his disgust at Swift's noxious compositions especially chapter four of Gulliver's Travels and three late poems. For example, in The Lady's Dressing Room, Strephon discovers to his horror his lover's chamber pot. Oh, Celia, 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 shits. Such order from confusion sprung, such gaudy tulips raised from dung. Murray denounced Swift's coprophilia as evidence of neurosis or even insanity. And Swift did indeed suffer a mental breakdown a few years after those scatological poems. In contrast, Norman Brown embraced Swift's excremental vision, seeing it as foretelling Freud's theories of repression and sublimation. In his 1959 book, Life Against Death, The Psychoanalytical Meaning of History, Brown argues that Swift's noxious compositions were a direct expression of Freud's theory that those matters below, oral, anal, and genital complexes in childhood, which are repressed, 
must return in the form of neurotic symptoms and or sublimation in adult lives. In other words, the excremental vision is an expression of humanity's common neurosis. As Joyce puts it in the wake, the tasks above are as the flasks below, saith the emerald canticle of Hermes. Joyce's rendering of the famous line from the work attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great Hermes, in the emerald tablets, things above are mirrored in the things below. Brown's hypothesis is that literature generally and Swift particularly sublimates repressed sexuality, especially anal sexuality, <clears throat> and that Swift's noxious compositions are precisely an expression of that repression and sublimation. It seems that Joyce, especially in the wake, embraces this connection between anal fetishism and writing. And many readers of the wake may have made an anal fetishistic mess of their own margins, as you can see from my copy. Notably, Shem the Oshimus conjures ink from his own waste products, a no uncertain quantity of obscene matter not protected by copyright in the United States of Aurania, and covers his body with that ink. Here from page 185 is Joyce's description of Shem's, the Oshimus's writing process, which of course is also a metaphor for Joyce's writing of the wake itself. The first till last alchemist wrote over every square inch of the only fool's cap available, his own body, till by its corrosive sublimation, one continuous present tense integument slowly unfolded all merry voicing mood molded cycle wheeling history. Sublimation is an alchemical process as well as a psycho psychoanalytical principle. A substance is sublimated when heated until it evaporates without passing through the liquid phase. The vapor then rises to the top of the vessel and then condenses back to the bottom. This passage notes that Shem's house is located at No Number Brimstone Walk, Asia in Ireland. Brimstone is sulfur, a key ingredient in alchemical processes. Asia in Ireland alludes to the Eastern roots of alchemy. The passage is filled with many other alchemical sexual and scatological references and puns. So perhaps ag lag glomeratively asses banking after all and arc last for arc list on his last public misappearance circling the square for the death bet of St. Ignatius poison ivy and brandishing his bell bearing stilo, the shining human of the wilds of change. If what is sauce for the Zassi is sauce for the Zassimus. This passage agglomerates a number of alchemical elements, including references to the death vet or wake of St. Ignatius, whose spiritual exercises led believers through alchemical processes of purgation, illumination, and union in reference to Sosimus's book of the keys of the work, in which he states that all alchemical operations are one, with a play on the saying, what sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander, about the reconciliation of opposites. Circling the square is another alchemical principle related to the unification of opposites, which we'll discuss in the next section. Prior to this passage, on page 184, Shem cooks his eggs in an athanor, an alchemical furnace, mixing ordinary and alchemical ingredients, for example, sulfate de sud, and chanting a magical formula, fermented words, abracadabra, calubra colorum, and lingua ea calamus scribe, velocitor scribentus, my tongue is a ready pen, as below, so above. Both D. Bernard and Atherton suggest that Joyce did not undertake a serious study of alchemy, but probably picked up alchemical themes and references from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Joyce was undoubtedly also aware of alchemy through the writings of theosophists such as H.P. Blavatsky. These modern alchemists were attacked as frauds and forgers, charges that were also leveled at Shem by Sean, who tells us the alchemist was a sham and a low sham and his lowness creeped out first via foodstuffs. Joyce's excremental vision allows the double movement of the hermetic dictum, as above, so below, as below, so above. As Joyce puts it in the wake, the tasks above are as the flasks below, saith the emerald canticle of Hermes. The emerald canticle and Joyce's pun on the hermetic 
double movement are depicted in this illustration from a Renaissance alchemical text depicting Maria the prophetess, also known as Maria the Jewess, who was credited by Zosimus with inventing an alchemical apparatus that copied the natural process of distillation, which you see here. That is, Mary invented equipment that copied the process depicted in the wake where ALP is the river Liffey that flows to the sea, rises up, evaporates, sublimates, and precipitates again, rain, rain, rain. Here we see then one of the few known female alchemists demonstrating the hermetic dictum. It rises from earth to heaven and descends again to earth, thereby combining within itself the powers of the above and the below. Joyce's flasks below are filled from Maria's distillery. She also invented the Trubicos, a distillation apparatus where the condensate drips through from a clay vessel through three copper tubes into three glass vessels. Marie, Mary the Jewess appears in Finnegan's Wake in answer to the first riddle, who among other things sucks life's elixir from the petty pinkle, pickles of the Jewess. The answer, Ben McCool. Joyce's version of the legend of the giant's causeway has Finn McCool nursing Irish whiskey from the breasts of Maria the prophetess. In alchemy, life's elixir is procured from the philosopher's stone and makes the drinker immortal. Of course, it's Irish whiskey or the water of life that wakes Finn in the first book of the wake with the Gaelic incantation. Ishka Baha, repeat after me. Ishka Baha. Ishka Baha. Ishka means water and Baha means light. Therefore, Ishka Baha means something like life water or water of life. Thank you. Maria the prophetess is also credited with the axiom of Maria, a numerological expression of the cyclical nature of the hermetic dictum and the alchemical principle of the unification of opposites, sun and moon, man and woman, life and death, circle and square. Here is an image from the Renaissance alchemical text Symbola Orae Mense that shows an alchemist circling the square with his magic wand or rod that also wends its way into the wake. Shem, the alchemist life wand pen, Venus, inscribes magic words that transform excrement into literature. Ta-da! The axiom of Maria goes like this. One becomes two, two becomes three, and out of the third comes one as the fourth. This cyclical process can run either way. One becomes four and four becomes one. Four is the four elements, the four seasons, the four directions, and so on. Needless to say, and much could be said about this, the number 432 is significant in the wake. Circling the square is an alchemical symbol for the recombination of the four elements into a higher unity. The square motif is a familiar one in the wake. Joyce's sigla for the book is the square, and the square shape runs throughout the book, the four evangelists, the four bedposts, the four books, everywhere you look, the wake takes the shape of a square. Yet the story is fundamentally circular and all-encompassing, with the ending flowing back again to the beginning. The alchemical symbol of the circle represents unity. The square represents the four elements. The four elements are unified in the quintessence as a result of a process of distillation and sublimation, which takes a circular form that represents the return to the original wholeness of soul or spirit extracted in its purest state, personified as Luna. 
In this presentation, I've layered these images on top of each other to suggest the many layers of meaning and significance of these symbols in the wake of which alchemy is only one. So this is the alchemical process that produces the philosopher's stone. It's an analog for the artistic process that produced Finnegan's wake, extracted from excrement and dug out of the dung heap. The waste of the wake is by various operations and incantations transformed into art, the squared circle. Following Bolderoff, it is specifically the diagram on page 293, the triangle, uh, triangle circle geometric figure, which is at the heart of the transformative capacity of the wake. It is, of course, also a depiction of ALP's genitals, bringing in the Freudian Oedipal complex, the repressed desire for the mother itself at the heart of adult neurosis and sublimation. It is the manipulation of the substance of the work and contemplations of its mystical significance that all base matter is transformed into the sublime. The diagram itself on 293 is a, a, a microcosm, a miniature as Carla Barrett describes it for, the, for Joyce's cyclic overlapping universe represented here by a diagram of the motion of the heavens from Giordano Bruno. Joyce took from Bruno of Nola the theory of the coincidence of contraries, which goes beyond tying what is highest to what is lowest. The principle of the coincidence of contraries states that everything in the universe is comprised of contradictory elements, which can result in synthesis of new elements or processes, including in sexual union or conjugation. Bruno depicts this conjugation in On the Immense. Bacchus and Ceres are thus, the sun and the earth too, as neighbors hidden from our senses reach. They clinch in amazing embraces. Everywhere that they touch the fecund thighs of the mother with their dew. The tantric aspects of this image, which have their own corollaries in Western and other cultures are inescapable. While Bruno may or may not have been directly influenced by Indic culture, he was most certainly focused on that crossroads of East and West Egypt, Alexandria particularly. Bruno did not call himself an alchemist, but rather a practitioner of magic, specifically high magic, which corresponds closely with the more spiritual and scientific alchemical practices. During his time, the late 16th century, practices such as astronomy and astrology were still not fully separated. And likewise, chemistry and alchemy, math and numerology. There were quacks, charlatans, and con men all about and mixed in with the likes of Bruno, Tycho Brahe, Kepler, and better earlier, Copernicus. We see the coincidence of contraries throughout the wake, for example, in the brother battles, <clears throat> which sometimes resulted in a third composite figure, which is not just a com combination of the two, but a new dynamic element. Of course, the underlying forces of the archetypal figures of HCE and ALP run through the entirety of the wake. The combined state of the two are the generative creative force, described by Giordano Bruno as the life force that informs things according to the two sovereign principles. You can see then how a simple divinity that is found in all things, a fertile nature, preserving mother of the universe, shines forth in different subjects according to the different ways in which she is communicated and takes on different names. Therefore, the ancients understood the two sovereign bodies near our globe and mother goddess, that is the sun and the moon as the life force that informs things according to the two sovereign principles. We examined in some detail Joyce's references to tantric practice in our previous presentation on the yoga of Finnegan's Wake, in which we argued that the underlying force of the archetypal figures of HCE and ALP correspond to the combined object in Tantra, the generative force of creation. In alchemy, these forces are reconciled in masculine and feminine symbols of the king and queen, sun and moon. As Jan Joseph Campbell points out, Joyce is compounding all these myths in a valid syncretism, pointing out that they are all metamorphoses of a basic material. That is, Joyce is an alchemist, the wake is a dung heap, and philosopher's stone. Sleep, where in the waste is the wisdom? Mind your boots going out.